um, I present you Kublai Kabechi that works for Bloomberg and he is going to present you load testing on the Python open source project. Kubilai? Uh, thanks. thanks for coming everyone. Uh, my name is Kubilai, I work for Bloomberg in London and today I'm going to talk about load testing and specifically uh, a Python based open source tool called uh, Locust. So, this is a product we own in, at, uh, in Bloomberg. Uh, this is like a spreadsheet application specialized for the financial markets. You can have a list of securities you want to follow, like stocks, currencies, and stuff. And you can have real-time market data on the columns. And you can build a like, market monitor uh, using this uh, application. We also support like real-time editing and uh, like collaborative editing and sharing. So it's a new cool product. That, but uh, we are still in the process of uh, releasing it, so it will eventually be released to all of our uh, user base, but uh, we are not there yet. So uh, that's why we usually uh, have like meetings to discuss our uh, release. Should we speed up things or should we slow down and focus on some bugs and stuff? So in one of those uh, meetings, we ask this question to ourselves, like what is uh, our capacity? And we notice that we don't have a like concrete answer to that which we should have. Then, uh, that's why we decided to uh, like invest some time on this and uh, to find out what our capacity is. So how can you uh, find out your system capacity? Is like You can do this by exploring your system qualities. Well, what can be those uh, like qualities? It can be capacity in terms of your uh, infrastructure. Is, is the infrastructure si sized adequately to your needs? Or does your uh, system respond quickly enough? Or can, can your application grow to handle feature volumes in terms of like scalability? And does your system behave correctly uh, under load, which is a stability concern, right? So how do you uh, assess those uh, quality points? Uh, there are a few methods. I will uh, mainly mention performance testing, load testing, and stress testing, because they, they have some overlap, but uh, they're also a bit different from each other. So I just wanted to briefly mention them. In performance testing, you are evaluating the uh, performance of your component against a benchmark. You don't do this, but, uh, you don't have to uh, create a high load, but instead you tune your application and your testing to, to establish a benchmark behavior. And your aim is not to find defects in your uh, application by performance testing. Uh, load testing, on the other hand, on the other hand uh, this time you feed the system with the largest task it can possibly handle then you gradually increase the load until things start break, breaking. So you do this by creating a simulation of uh, virtual users. So you try to replicate your uh, like real users with a simulation. And in this case, you are actually, uh, your goal is actually find the uh, defects in your application that might be hidden under a regular load, but uh, can be exposed uh, under high load. Those can be like memory management issues or buffer overflows and stuff. And you also want to determine the upper limit for all of your components in your system. So your application can handle the uh, load, but maybe your database is hitting its limit or your network is causing problems. So you want to determine the bo bottleneck in your, in your system. And stress testing, lastly, it's, it's similar in the sense that you still attempt to break the system down. But instead of creating a high load, you try to take the resources away from the system. You can like take a few machines down or you can just turn down a third party service that you depend on and you try to observe the behavior of your uh, application after failure ideally you would expect your system uh, to be to gracefully fail and uh, recover so i will continue with load testing uh, uh, specifically but before but before you invest uh, any of these methods there are uh, there are a few points that I think you should uh, consider. First of all, you must have like uh, monitoring tools in place. Otherwise, you won't be able to benefit any uh, of uh, those methods because you you won't be able to see the uh, end result basically. And for specifically for load testing, you need to identify the usage patterns of your application, like because in the simulation you want. You want your simulation to be a representative of, of your uh, real users, right? So you need to uh, know their workflows and stuff. And you need to define your success criteria in measurable terms. So 
Like, do you want to handle a thousand requests uh, a second or a minute, or do you want to be like responding uh, like in less than 50 sec uh, milliseconds or so? So you need to define that. And you should, th that's the last one, but definitely not least, you should always isolate your testing environment. I even have like another slide dedicated to that because like when I say isolate the testing environment, I mean two things. First, you need to isolate the test testing environment from your production environment so that when you create a load, you don't actually like affect your users. And you should also isolate the clusters that you generate the load from, from the uh, system that's uh, under test. Because like load testing will require a lot of CPU power and it will use a lot of resources. If you do, do the testing on the same machine where your service runs, then you will be taking resources away from your uh, service basically. So how does, uh, what's Locust and how does it uh, help with load testing? It's, it's an open source uh, project, it's Python based, and it allows you to define your user behavior in code, which is super powerful, I will come to that. And it's based on coroutines and it uses an async approach, which makes it very uh, easy to scale and distribute the uh, load. It's, so, it's also a validated battle-tested product. We use it in uh, Bloomberg, but I have heard that like the video game Battlefield, they use it uh, before releases, they create like millions of uh, virtual users using Locust to uh, test the game. So uh, Locust provides like two different interfaces uh, to run the tests. First, first one is a basically command line tool. You can provide the no web option and you, you should provide a locust file. This is where your user behaviors, uh, behavior is uh, in code. I will, come, uh, I will show some examples of locust files. Then you provide the number of users you want to uh, generate, which is 100 in this case. And you need to provide a hatch rate. This is the rate which locust will generate your, uh, your users. And you can provide an uh, upper limit, uh, 1,000 in this case like stop testing when you hit a thousand requests and it will print the stats uh, to the console. Or you can use uh, this web UI. You can again provide the similar uh, parameters to, for your testing and once you hit start swarming, then you will see this nice dashboard. I don't know if you can see, but you can see the request types and request names and you will see a bunch of statistics about uh, those requests like number of failures, average response time, maximum response time and stuff. And there are like uh, a few tabs at the top uh, in the failures or exceptions tab. You can see a categorization of your failures. We, like You can see which requests are failing with uh, uh, which error code. So if you have good error codes, for example, you can notice your database is failing uh, before some, something else. And, so. and the, that button is to stop the testing, which is important. And this is a very simple uh, Locust file. Uh, you need to provide two classes in your Locust file, which one is the one at the bottom, which is the entry point. Uh, it's a Locust class. And website task is the task set you want to uh, execute. So in the task set, you need to use the task decorator to define your user's action. In this case, this is a simple website, and it has just two pages, uh, home and profile. And as you can see, task decorator accepts an integer argument, which is basically the weight uh, you can assign to that action. In this case, home page is like more popular than the profile page, so you can assign a, a higher rate. This is where you can apply your like usage pattern uh, to, to the code. And Locust also gives you a, a special hook. It's on start hook. This, is, this will be called only once when the user is generated. So if you need to do it, any like preliminary work you can like do things like authentication or if you want to like get random users from somewhere you can do that so that you don't have to do extra work in the actions itself and in the locus class you provide the task set you just implemented and you can also define the minimum and maximum wait time and this is this is the time that locus is going to wait before sending the next request for that user so it's either going to like it's going to wait some seconds between 5 and uh, 15 in this case. But what makes, so uh, I forgot to mention, so by default Locus comes with an HTTP uh, client, so if your service communicates in HTTP, you don't have to implement anything uh, more than this. But 
if you have some like crazy protocol for your service or it doesn't know about HTTP, which was the case for us, you can implement your uh, own uh, custom clients and give it to the locus. So in this case, we assume that you have a Python client that can communicate with your service. And in this case, we just wrap this send request method uh, uh, with, with this uh, class. So Locust provides you, like exposes events. So as long as in an action, as long as you, can, you fire a failure or a success event, that action will be recorded in the statistics. So in this case, we try to send a request using our uh, custom client. If it fails with an exception, we send a failure uh, event. If it succeeds, we send a success event. For this event, you need to provide some parameters like the request name, request type, response time. So you need to measure the respons response time by yourself. Or you can also provide the exception type to, to get a categorization of your uh, errors in the dashboard. So this is how you can write a, a custom uh, client for Locus, basically. Once you have that, you need to, this is the entry point again, you need to just initialize a uh, custom client and assign it to the client in the Locus class. So you, wrote, you write your tests and how do you run them? How do you deploy them? We, we use containers because mainly they are well suited for such tasks, uh, singular tasks, and they're uh, lightweight. They're very easy to deploy. And the most important thing is Locust works in a master and slave fashion. So you can bring up as many slaves as you want to create a higher load. So when you have a like single container for each slave, you can just uh, bring up as many uh, containers as you want, and you, you can just register them to the master uh, master locust instance, and you will be able to generate a high load. In this in this case, we, uh, we use like Docker Compose, and it's just a simple argument to to the run command. Uh, like we want to create a locust instance with like say 20 slaves, and it will just bring up 20 plus one containers, and all of them will start swarming. So this is a like, simple diagram uh, of our architecture. On the left, this is an isolated cluster where our test runs. We have a single master, a bunch of slaves. We also use a Redis instance to share the data across slaves. We pre-populate some data from our database into uh, Redis before running the tests. So we have like uh, some user IDs and some other stuff in the Redis. And slaves can just pick a random user ID from the Redis instance and start sending requests with, uh, for that user to our uh, alpha cluster, which is like isolated. So our services is running on alpha in this case. So uh, yeah, we did some test runs and they were quite embarrassing actually. So we, while testing with a load that we were expecting to have soon, we noticed uh, many drop, drop requests uh, in the test and it was a single request in our service that was taking too long and blocking others and the queues in our uh, uh, the queues were, were f uh, filling up pretty quickly uh, so we were dropping the request so in order to uh, find out the exact problem in that request we had to add uh, had to add more instrumentation around our database queries uh, around our like third party service calls so then we, after more instrumentation, we, we did the tests again and we noticed that we actually introduced a regression in a database query very recently. There was like very obvious optimization, so we just fixed the query and uh, shipped the results, uh, shipped the code, and uh, this is what we get as the results. So this is average response time uh, for that uh, request specifically. And uh, yellow line is our development environment, pink line is our production, and purple is our beta environment. As you can see, the day we fixed the issue on development, it just went down from like three seconds to just a few uh, milliseconds. Then you can also stage, uh, you can also see the stage rollout. Like we have a, a few stages in beta and production, so it uh, took a few days to eventually hit production, and just uh, the fix was on production. Then they all went down to a few milliseconds. So this was like a bit of a success story for us uh, using Locust. And yeah, that's all I have today. And thanks for coming. And if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. to generate the load. Agents, yeah. So the be sure that you restate the question so that yeah, the recording captures it. 
so the question is like whether you can use your regular computers to generate the load. Uh, this is actually possible and it's a good solution because your computers are like pretty powerful compared to what you have on on the cloud. So you can yeah some of the tests I I was just running them on on my computer. It's it has like uh, it's 16 cores or something eight cores. And yeah, you can use them, and you can if you can just build a small network of computers and distribute load uh, among them. Yeah, that's possible, and it's a good idea, I guess. Um, is it possible in uh, Locus uh, to share data between uh, users? I mean, uh, let's say a user creates data, and uh, another user with uh, other rights, let's say an admin user, a super user, uh, will use this data. Um, is this possible in Locus? So the quest question is like whether it's possible to share that data between uh, like slave instances or any instance of Locust. Uh, no, uh, like you can communicate with the master, but that's why we we were using Redis. So basically, for example, in our case, when when a user like created a resource in our database, it was also inserting the idea of that resource to Redis so that some other user, some other slave can uh, do some operations based on this. So you need to have a like shared instance of something that uh, both uh, can use. Yes? Are you familiar with JMaker and can you compare them to this one? Uh, the question is, uh, am I familiar with JMaker and what's uh, like, can I, can I compare them? Like I heard about it, I read about it, I haven't used it, but uh, I think it's not possible to provide custom clients like that doesn't communicate in HTTP in JMatter. Maybe uh, you can, I don't know, but uh, and also you cannot provide your user behavior in code, uh, I guess. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's then. Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, like we we compared some solutions, but I haven't actually tried uh, running a lot test with JMatter. So the question is how, how do we analyze the results and can we like integrate with the uh, CI to fail the build or something. Right now we haven't like completely automated the process so it's not running on CI we have to like it's just a single command but we have to manually run it. So right now what we are thinking about is like Locust gives you a, like CSV file uh, with the response times and stuff. So we want to have that job running on CI on Jenkins maybe not every for every pull request but like regularly during the day and just compare the differences like for specific requests and we can maybe if it's up like 10 percent just fail the job and something like that you can do that. Yes. Um, is Locust able to import uh, curl archive scenarios to fill in automatically the, um, uh, the user behavior? I don't know. So the question is, is Locust disabled to import what? Sorry. Import a curl archive. A curl, curl archive files? Uh, no, I, like, I haven't seen anything like that, but I, I don't know, to be honest. Are there cases where you discovered a problem in production that Locust didn't detect? And can you, did you tell us what you learned from that, if there were? Uh, so the question is, if we uh, notice something on production that Locust failed to detect, uh, no, we haven't so far, but uh, maybe they are still there and <laughs> we haven't noticed the, <laughs> them yet. <laughs> yes, please, at the back. GI? I, I can't really hear. So, so what's the question? Have you ever tried Locust in gRPC, like Google RPC? Oh, so, so instead of using HTTP protocol, we were, uh, the question was whether you can use gRPC protocol. As I can say, we can. We are using like totally custom in-house protocol. So, if you have a gRPC client in Python, yes, you can. You can do anything you want. And is there any support in Locust for REST, higher level REST than just talking HTTP and implementing myself? Uh, so the question is whether there's support in Locust for REST, like at a higher level than HTTP. No, I think it just uh, gives you a bare uh, HTTP client. Then on top, on top of that, maybe you want to have some abstractions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as 
I understand you need the Redis database. Is it? Uh, I'm thinking about a uh, use case with Locus where the load injectors are not on the same machine nor even the same network, but on different networks and different clouds to have some kind of swarm of mm -hmm. injections. Is it possible to do this given the Redis constraint? So uh, when you want to like oh, restate the question, yeah, I was going to. Okay. <laughs> So the question is when you want to like create a higher load with a, like a bunch of different clusters where, where they are not in the same network, do you, how do you share data between them basically? So Redis is like just our solution. You can still have a like uh, common place or you can, you can split your data. So we use Redis to pre-populate some data, right? You can, you, can, you can split your data like for some specific users just go to this machine and some others use that. So they, like among clusters, you don't need to uh, communicate. Yep. Yes. What do you use to represent your uh, test reporting? So the question is, what do we use uh, to represent our test reporting? So right now we are just like manually skimming through the CSV files, and the, uh, we have a dashboard uh, with our uh, like uh, instrumentation. So we are just going through them and uh, analyzing the results. But when we move to CI, yeah, we need to have an uh, automated process to basically compare the results between so different runs. Not N no, they are not automated. So the question is, what's the next step uh, for this project? For us, uh, first we have a, uh, like we have two goals. We want to automate the process definitely to have it on CI, and also we want to test some other uh, backend uh, service that is completely in a different protocol. So we would like to write a uh, client for that, and uh, it's like a pub sub mechanism. So we want to test uh, those uh, as well. Yes. And uh, how Locus can ensure that uh, a different injector is not going to reuse the same data, so to not repeat the test, the same test uh, many times? Yeah. So the question is, uh, how do you prevent like using the same data, getting the same data from Redis uh, among different like Locus slaves? We just remove the data. Ah. So if one user use it, use use the data, it will just remove it from Redis. Uh, yeah, it's it's in the code. But what we do is like if initially you can provide the number of users you want to generate. So we take that number and pre-populate the data according to that. So if it's 1,000 users, we will have 1,000 different user IDs in our Redis instance. So each one can take just one. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming.